we are all familiar with the concepts of the fatherland and the motherland. What I would like to suggest today is that the motherland in particular offers us an inclusive and restorative sense of belonging in an increasingly fragmented and polarized world. When we imagine the fatherland, we probably think of a nation state, a country, the United States maybe. If we think of the motherland, however, some of us may imagine a country, maybe one that um, we left as a child or where our ancestors are from. Others may imagine a country, a region, a town um, that is related to their personal history or to their family's history. And yet others may envision a place that they call home, that is closely connected to their personal identity, and which may or may not have anything to do with their mothers. My personal motherland um, combines all of those. This is my grandmother's farmhouse in the Italian Alps. And I spent pretty much every Sunday afternoon there playing with my cousins or sitting in the kitchen and listening to my mother, aunts, and grandmother as they talked, argued, gossiped while preparing food. So the fatherland and the motherland then elicit very different emotional reactions. The fatherland is more abstract. It invokes our duty, like soldiers fighting for the fatherland. I like to think here of Uncle Sam pointing his finger in our face, telling us to shape up and ship up. The motherland, on the other hand, is much more personal. It's emotional. And one that is welcoming and accepting. Like Lady Liberty, standing high with her torch in New York Harbor and welcoming the tired and poor from all over the world. She doesn't tell us what to do, but she assures us that we're going to be okay. Now, these images and symbols are not new. They are not specific to a US context, but actually they're quite international. So, um, for example, Ale Mostaganemi, who was a contemporary Algerian writer, she has her main character, Khalid, say the following about his country. I realize that you can be orphaned by your nation. Some countries exercise humiliation, harshness, and oppression, tyranny, and selfishness. Some countries lack the idea of motherhood. They are only like fathers. Very similarly, in a different context, Chino Achebe, in his seminal Nigerian novel, Things Fall Apart, similarly has uh, Okonkwo, who is banished to his motherland um, after failing in his fatherland, has his uncle Uchendu make the following distinction. It's true that a child belongs to his father, but when a father beats his child, it seeks sympathy in its mother's hut. A man belongs to his fatherland when life is sweet and things are good. But when there is sorrow and bitterness, he finds refuge in his motherland. So on a global scale then, the fatherland claims us in a patriarchal fashion. While the motherland, I would argue, offers a counter narrative to that. It functions as a place where characters can confront their loss, they can let down their pretense, and they can start to develop a deep and authentic sense of belonging. And so the motherland is a place of loss and renewal that has powerful potential to provide us with a radically different approach when it comes to understanding our connections to nature, patriarchy, and nationalism in the 21st century. Let's start with nature. Fatherland, the fatherland or nationalistic discourses often promote the exploitation of natural resources. While the motherland likely invites the protection of the land because there exists a mutual connection and an, and an idea of dependency. So Catherine Roach, for example, conducted an environmental study 
um, she's conducted a study on, on environmental discourse that is centered on this idea of Mother Earth. And in her book, Mother Nature, she distinguishes between three concepts of how Mother Nature is being used. The bad mother, the good mother, and the hurt mother. Now, if nature is the bad mother, it causes destruction. Think hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes. Right? So because nature, as bad mother, is all-powerful and dangerous, it needs to be contained and tamed. Nature as the good mother is the exact opposite. It is self-sacrificing, all-giving. And so again, here, it can be exploited without scruples. And this connection is again one-sided. We as humans don't owe anything to nature because she is supposed to take care of us. It's only in the third image, the hurt mother, that we see a reciprocal relationship as it, on the one hand, allows us to recognize the vulnerability of nature, but at the same time then, also recognize our own responsibility and duty towards it. It empowers us for action. Like Okonkwo and Khalid's motherlands, it becomes a place of healing, where because we are confronted with loss or potential loss, we then have to reevaluate our own place and map a new sense of agency and belonging. As a comparative literature scholar, I have been fascinated by the way that the motherland functions in so many different cultural contexts. Um, and I have noticed that even though everybody recognizes it fairly quickly, it actually is being used in four distinct ways in a very literal sense, as the land of one's mother. Not much more to say about that. The, the second prominent way that I see the motherland used is as in the mother nation. This is a female version of the fatherland. When we think of mother nations, you may imagine Mother Russia, Mother India, Great Britain as the motherland in a colonial context. And I want to clarify here that as the mother nation, it actually does not uh, provide a counter narrative to patriarchal structures. In fact, it serves as an emotional version of the fatherland. And so in the end, upholds patriarchal structures and retains a focus on the nation state. The third way that motherland is being used in literature is as in stories pertaining to the realm of mothers. And so we delve into the world of mothers, either by focusing on a specific mother, very often this mother either is dying, or the story is written from the point of view of a child who has a problematic, if not dysfunctional, relationship with his mother. Or the story focuses on female characters whose life revolves around motherhood. This fourth Use of motherland is the one that I find most powerful and constructive, and that is where it is a metaphor for identity, belonging, and renewal. Here, the motherland enables us to question and renegotiate our identity through the telling of stories and mapping of belonging. So to see an example of this from literature, I would like to tell you about Vinita Vijay Raghavan's novel Motherland, which initially paints a picture of disjunction and fragmentation, as 15-year-old Maya is estranged both from her mother as well as from her Indian culture, and Maya's mother is not on speaking terms with Maya's grandmother. So the mother-daughter relationships in this novel are fraught with distrust and feelings of betrayal, and most characters really feel isolated and estranged. They feel out of place. They do not belong. As Maya and Amama take ill, though, they start to take care of each other. And they start to open up specifically by reading and discussing together the um, Indian classic story of Rama and Sita. And in this, Mother Earth plays a special role. Amama, Maya's grandmother, explains Mother Earth's role here. 
Mother Earth, she's the mother to all creatures, and she gives Sita refuge. That's what mothers do, Maya. They accept, even when no one else does. This welcoming acceptance allows the various female characters in this novel to unearth and confront traumatic and repressed and hidden memories and experiences that they were not able to share before because they were laden with guilt and shame. But like in the environmental dynamics of the Mother Earth, the focus at the end on the hurt mother allows those female characters to confront their traumas and to renew their connections and relationships in a positive manner. So it is not the place, the novel is set in Tamil Nadu, it's not the place, but it is the connection between these female characters, and I would like to say the intergenerational, transnational connection that they share that allows them to explore their relationships authentically. In the end of the novel, um, the grandmother dies, but she leaves Maya uh, a, uh, a collection of memories that she has written down. And these are memories that Maya has shared with her, and these are memories that the grandmother first time shared with Maya. And so this is what Maya says after she receives this and grieves for her grandmother. A mama had given me maps on my past and future to navigate by. There weren't maps of our roads and our homes, but there were maps of the inside, maps of the heart. And they could only be drawn by those who loved you. I could live anywhere, be grafted and take root anywhere, and anywhere could become home. My own grandmother passed away a year ago at the age of 98. And when uh, you know, her death announcement was published. The saying was on it. A mother is like the root of a tree. It is origin and strength, motivation, support, and life. And the roots go much deeper than the eye can see. If the eye can't see, then we need to collectively confront and share those memories that may be painful in order then to paint a new picture with the stories that we share. And so the motherland is more than a place, but it functions as a map where we reroute ourselves and then invite others into these places and stories so that everyone can be recognized and belong. Thank you. <laughs>